Hello everybody and welcome to my review of volume number one of Ichiro Sakake's light novel series Outbreak Company, The Power of Moe. This one is released by J Novel Club. It's currently only available in ebook format. Uh, now in Japan there have been 18 volumes of this series released. The most recent was released in August of 2017. As far as I understand that is the end of the series. Ichiro Sakake, you might also know, is the author of Blue Steel Blasphemer, which is another series that Jane Novel Club is publishing. And I first became familiar with his work through the anime Chika, the Coffin Princess, uh, which we have the anime, we have the manga, but we've never gotten the light novels. I'm kind of fingers crossed that now that Jane Novel's brought two of his titles over, Maybe we'll get Chika because I loved the anime and I'd really, really like to read the book, but we will see what ends up happening. So this one is written in the first person point of view from the main character, Kano Shinichi's point of view. Now, he is a 16-year-old otaku who has spent the past year as a neat locked basically in his room, only coming out to basically use the washroom shower and maybe grab a bite to eat in the house. Now one morning his parents quite literally break down his door and basically tell him he has three options. Either go back to school, get a job, or get thrown out. And that's pretty much it. So Shinichi being the kind of person that he is and realizing that he's already been bullied at school just because of the fact that he is an otaku. He figures, well, school will be insufferable because, well, he's still an otaku, but now he's been away for a year, so he decides to go and get himself a job. When a company comes looking for otakus, this seems like a golden opportunity to him. Until he finds himself suddenly drugged, knocked unconscious, and ferreted to another world where he is told that his job now in this other world is to introduce anime otaku type culture, so be it games, anime, manga, to the local inhabitants because they have shown a interest in this very unique Japanese export. Now, Outbreak Company, of course, is an isekai, one of a long line. This one actually started back in 2011, so it's a slightly older series. Like I said, it's now currently finished in Japan with 18 volumes. But what kind of sets it apart is, first of all, it is not the type of isekai where we just start with our character suddenly being in another world and we don't know why or, you know, they're reincarnated. In this case, Shinichi Kano, we know exactly why he's in this other world. We know how he got there. We know what his purpose in that world is. So it makes it slightly different because the character isn't just on an aimless journey. The character has a set sort of goal and is pursuing it. So first of all, it makes it a little bit differently. Second, the other thing about this is that it shows a character who, one of the things that we talk sometimes about and uh, other reviewers have mentioned in other light novels and so forth, is how these fantasy worlds will often have, of course, things like slavery, very, you know, racist type of class systems. This one is no different, but what sets it apart is that we actually have a character who is aware of it, who still questions it, who doesn't just take it for granted that, oh, this is just the world that we're in. No, he actually stands up against it, he actually seeks ways to try and undermine it, and he is actually aware of his own privilege. He sits there and often says that he is lucky that he is Japanese. He has been very blessed to grow up in a generally peaceful country where he hasn't had to worry about these kind of class delineations and how racism is something that actively you can fight and feel like you actually are accomplishing something as opposed to this place where you could be considered a criminal for doing so. So having that self-awareness and still sort of maintaining that social idea and that sort of thirst for societal justice that 
most, I would say, average teenagers probably have in this day and age, that sets this character a little bit apart from some of the other isekai type characters that we've seen. Now, I would say that probably his, the fact that it's first person, uh, we do get his internal monologues about how he is freaking about, out about certain things, um, such as the JSDF uh, soldier who is assigned to protect him, Minori. Uh, well, we, we get quite the monologue about how beautiful her breasts are on a couple of occasions. And I mean, I suppose if he's a 16-year-old boy, uh, well, I guess that's kind of realistic, actually, thinking back to when I was a 16-year-old boy. But, uh, but nonetheless, you know, you may find it just a little bit much at times. The way that he kind of goes a little bit gaga over all of these, you know, he starts going crazy moe over some of these characters. Um, I think because Sakake has written quite a number of light novels, he introduces all of these kind of very tropey type things into it, but it's almost like a gag, right? So we have a maid character who's also half elf, and even Kano, he is actually in awe of the fact that she is the perfect embodiment of all things Moi. Uh, we have a lolly empress. Uh, she is still his age, but in typical light novel fashion, you know, she is looks like she's only 10 years old, even though she's legal. Um, <laughs> so there are a number of elements in this book that you will sort of sit there and go, yeah, okay, we've seen this a million times. But what I really kind of liked about it, and that kind of made it work, is that the Empress is multidimensional. Even though she is most definitely given Sundere type uh, personifications, she shows other sides. This In this first volume, they actually allow for her to show a deeper side of her. Um, Kano himself is insightful at times in terms of how he sees her role as an empress and sort of is able to look deeper beyond just sort of the surface of a person. Even the maid, uh, she is developed fairly well. There's actually quite a bit of a, a sweet story where because of the whole class system and everything else, the maid is illiterate. Um, and so Sh Shinichi starts to teach her how to read Japanese. Um, and because he wants to share like the things that he's interested in, right? With the manga and everything else. And that was the other thing that I thought was kind of interesting was that it is one of those series that given what the setup is, it actually acknowledged some of the difficulties of trying to import sort of this culture into this foreign land. Um, you know, things like, do we have a translator? But wait, if most of the public is illiterate, we can't even just do subtitles because they won't be able to read it. So there's all of these difficulties that kind of come up with trying to ship a product from a foreign nation into a sort of medieval type level in terms of its education and everything else land and that's actually addressed which I thought was kind of cool. And then finally as the book progresses we get into a pretty dark ending for this volume. Um, I mean, certainly, like, it's not like um, Ari Ferretta Dark, where we go like, Hi, I'm Happy Otaku, now I want to kill everybody! It's not like that. Um, <laughs> when I say dark, I just mean that it becomes more somber, and it becomes more serious. And this sort of idea that starts off that just seems kind of like happy-go-lucky of, you know, Oh, hey, let's introduce this thing that I'm in love with to people who know nothing about it takes a bit of a darker side of it, a darker edge, which, again, like, I think that is the one thing about this book that surprised me was, generally speaking, the awareness of the book, the awareness of the writer uh, in terms of the difficulties that this would present, the real, actual logistics of what it would take to make this happen, uh, the awareness of Kano Shinichi as a character that 
he is aware of his himself as an otaku. He's aware of his own sort of failings as an individual because of his obsessions. But at the same time, has some insight to other people and is not ignorant about what's going on around him and doesn't let the fact that he is obsessed with certain otaku things cloud his judgment when it comes to seeing the world for what it is. And of course, as I said, even with just the way that this is constructed, uh, you know, you have an author that is very aware of the fact that he is using things that are very archetypal, but there are ways to give it a little bit more depth and everything else. I was actually surprised uh, by how much I ended up kind of liking this book by the end of it. Uh, I will say that when I first started it, it was a little bit harder for me to get into. I think because when it starts, it's a little bit by the numbers, right? Uh, of course, we have the otaku freaking about the super cute maid, and, you know, then the, oh, the JSDF girl who's hot with big boobs, and, oh, lolly empress, and... Initially, when the book begins, it's so filled with these things that I thought, well, this is what this is going to be, and it's just going to probably turn into a harem, and we're just going to have very one-dimensional characters. You're the Sundari, you're the really cute shy girl, you're this, you're that. That's kind of what I thought this was going to be, but as I got more into the book, particularly getting into uh, Shinichi's awareness of the difficulties that his task is going to present and even the fact that he was kind of getting a bit overwhelmed and that he was actually taking sort of a, a mature view on this, it brought me into the book. It made me a lot more involved in it and a lot more interested in just like what is going to happen? And then finally, like I said, when it gets to this sort of more somber end of the book, like it ends on a much more mature, somber tone than definitely it began with, that alone made me go, wow, you know, I, I actually do want to see the second book of this and read the second volume because where does it go from here? Like where, you know, it once, now that this thought is in Shinichi's head, and I don't want to spoil it because it was cool to me. But now that this thought's in his head, where does he go? What's he going to do now? So, all in all, Outbreak Company um, was surprising. I really thought that this was going to be a very by-the-numbers, harem-type light novel, and it actually had some pretty bright moments to it. I won't say that it's groundbreaking in any sense, but in terms of a isekai novel that demonstrates some actual thought and planning, and as I said, starts in a very different way because our character has a set goal as opposed to just kind of wandering around not knowing why they're there or what they're supposed to do, that too made it very different in tone. So, if you like isekais, this one I would say definitely check out at least this first volume and sort of see how it goes for you. Uh, like I said, work through the beginning. The beginning will feel very familiar to a lot of stuff and it might not grab you right away, but as you get further into it, I definitely found myself becoming more and more invested in the characters and in the story. Now this one did have an anime adaptation. There were 12 episodes done. I really couldn't find anything online that there seemed to be a consensus of just how much of the light novels were covered by the anime. Um, I would say probably it's at least two or three. That seems to be the average, maybe even four. I don't think this is the kind of series that they're going to be able to expand a whole 12 episodes over just the one volume. So there's at least got to be two to three volumes covered. But again, I don't know if you've seen the anime and you know, because you've also maybe read the light novels, either online or whatever, please let me know in the comments down below. I'd love to be able to sort of add that information going forward. Uh, and of course, if you want to watch the anime, it is actually available on Crunchyroll. So you can go watch the anime if you want as well. So those are my thoughts on volume number one of Outbreak Company, The Power of Moi. It looked a lot fluffier than what it actually turned out to be, so it was a pleasant surprise, all in all.
So we are quickly coming up on December, and in December there are 25 light novels releasing. I, uh, wow, I can't even. But anyway, <laughs> when I do my December release video, it's going to be over an hour long at this rate. Even if I only talk for like two minutes per title, it's going to be 50 minutes. But anyway, uh, so there are a good number of volumes coming out in December that are ongoing series that I have been reading and reviewing so I want to try and get caught up before the new ones come out so my next review is going to be on volume number eight of The Devil is a Part-Timer. Uh, I just realized I'm like the last time I reviewed one of these books was back in August uh, which seems like a long time even though I guess really on average we get a new volume every three or four months but uh, this one's been sitting on my shelf for a while so I want to get to it especially because I did hear from quite a number of other reviewers that this was a really good volume and really kind of started pushing the story ahead so that will be my next review. So if you're brand new to the channel, you should consider subscribing. I do two to three reviews every single week, as well as a top 10 countdown of the best-selling light novels in Japan every single week. Thank you so much for joining me in this video, and I look forward to seeing you in the next one. Till then, bye-bye for now.